Hi, everyone. Pastor Galen, lead pastor at Shine Hills Church. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. We hope that these podcasts will be a real encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. You can also connect with Cheyenne Hills at CheyenneHills.org. Hope you enjoy the program. Across the street and around the world, Cheyenne Hills. Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. And Nathan, thanks for showing up today. Man, I always enjoy we're, hanging out with you we're guys. We're finally getting some almost summer weather, and this just feels good. I know. It makes me happy. Been waiting for it forever. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wyoming. I, I, it finally blew in. Right. So, uh, something was blowing, but we right. finally, finally got, I don't know how many, how long it'll last, but we've got it for a minute. <laughs> um, so you spoke at the men's group last Saturday, the men's breakfast. Yes, sir. Right. And uh, we, I so appreciate you. I had to leave. I had a funeral. I had to to, to uh, officiate and kind of just said, here's Nathan and here you are. And you jumped in, <laughs> but we recorded it. And oh, so, yes. um, you know, I've already asked you permission offline, but I, I just wanted to set it up just a little bit because I, I think what you had to say about, you, you had, you spoke a lot about truth mm-hmm. and you talked about, uh, just some of the, some of the challenges we have and the, in really the courage it takes to, to exercise truth. Right. And so I just like for everybody to, um, to tune in and, uh, take a listen to for the next, I don't know, it was about 30 minutes. Yes, but sir. great background, great historical uh, facts on this whole whole issue of truth. Thank you. Take a look at this. Every once in a while, I feel compelled to share a nerd moment with Nathan. A lot of times it has to do with church history. That's my current grad program uh, as I'm studying through historical theology. Um, One of the things that you just experienced was something that is beautiful that comes out of the history of the Reformation, but specifically through England, and it's just known as Puritanism. And Puritanism isn't how a lot of people try to picture it today. Really what it was, was it was just a group of people who wanted to get right down to the heart of what the church was supposed to be about, the basic doctrines of the church, and hope that it would be purified. Out of that movement came a group that really changed the United States of America known as separatists. What most people don't realize is that the founding of this country, there was a group of people, they were, uh, they were uh, followers of a man who was long dead, but he was a pastor with the last name of Brown. They were located in Scrooby, England, And what they did is they were trying to find a place where they could worship God freely and sing the simple hymns based out of God's word and get close to the Lord in their prayer life and and really live the way a Christian ought to live. And they couldn't quite do that because King James I was trying to kill them. So they escaped to Leiden, Holland at first, but then they noticed that their kids didn't really live according to the way they ought to live there. And so they decided, you know what, we're going to go back. We're going to find a ship and go to this new world. And what they did is they found a ship. It was called the Mayflower. And the Mayflower, when it landed in the United, or what would eventually become the United States of America, left us with a glorious legacy. The songs that you're singing right now go way back into the depth of history. They weren't all written at that time, but it was their children who carried forward the legacy of that faith. And so this has been already great this morning. I'm glad to be with you. Uh, I, I'm also kind of glad that Galen stepped out because I have so much praise. It would feel really awkward uh, if I were to talk so good about him right in front of him. We can't let that happen. But his, your current series you're going through on the subject of truth is so good. The, the May 1st sermon, if you go back and you listen to that, I would recommend you listen to it two or three times. Galen laid out the great story of, of truth how truth is rooted right in God's word, but secondly, how we have recognized truth over the ages. He even pointed back toward the great Greeks, the great Greek philosophers and the great minds that have illustrated that there is truth. And that's been the problem our culture has faced today. We live in a culture that doesn't believe that truth exists. And so what I wanted to do this morning is actually pick up on the theme that he's been laying down over the last month, And I want to talk about how we go and live that truth out. Before we do that, though, I'd like to bow in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for these wonderful men and for this extraordinary church. I thank you for Galen, uh, 
in his very evident walk with the Holy Spirit and his bringing the great truth out of the scriptures and applying it to the world around us right now. And Lord, today, I pray that this being the last of the men's meetings that uh, have gone on over this last, uh, these last several months, I pray, Lord, that you would bless, that you would fire us up to serve you in the culture around us this summer, that you would just work in our hearts and lives. Lord, may your Holy Spirit have free reign here today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. 1943 was the deadliest year in human history. It competes with 1942, but 1943 has very few parallels in human history. The largest confrontation in World War II was coming to a dramatic end in the Battle of Stalingrad. The Russian high, high command had commanded the Russian troops to go in and completely encircle General Paulus and his German 6th Army, and over 70,000 men were captured. But by the end of that battle, which is listed at over 2 million casualties, by the end of that battle, all that was left was a ruined city of Stalingrad. At, right after taking Stalingrad, the Battle of Kursk commenced. And the Battle of Kursk is the largest tank battle armored battle in world history, but according to some scholars that I've read, it also is potentially the largest air battle that was ever fought. And by the end of that battle, 257,000 casualties had happened. At the same time, in Warsaw, in Poland, thousands of Jewish civilians had been told that they were supposed to uh, um, report to the train station to be shipped off. They didn't know where. We now know it was to a place called Treblinka. But they had gotten the understanding that if they were shipped off, what would happen is that they would be killed. Reports were coming back. And so some of the bloodiest street fighting of the war happened as common, ordinary Jewish civilians took on the German army resisting deportation. Sadly, by June of 1943, already 1.3 million Jews had been deported and killed in concentration camps. It was also the height of the Japanese invasion of Asia. And we don't have solid statistics from that year because of the, the war was raging all over in Southeast Asia. But uh, around 10 million, we know by the end of the, uh, of, of the war would die there. The American and British forces were engaged in North Africa in Operation Torch. And as that drew to a close, and we were horribly hammered because we just had not been engaged in war at first. But thankfully, General Patton, when he came in, changed a lot of that after the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. We then set over into Sicily and began to attack in Sicily. At the same time, uh, we were already getting involved in, in uh, uh, the South Pacific and in a little known fact of the war in a whole different location, not with American or British troops, there was a horrific famine that happened in the country of Bengal, what is now Bangladesh. But at the time it was part of the greater Indian subcontinent region. But because of the war, over 3 million people died of starvation and famine in Bengal in that year, 1943. It was in that year, 1943, with conflict spanning the globe, a British professor from Oxford's Magdalen College was invited to do a series of talks at the University of Durham there in England, not in North Carolina. His name was Clive Stapleton Lewis, and he knew full well the nature of war. Lewis had been in the bloodiest fighting in the trenches in World War I, as a matter of fact, had lost his very best friend there and wound up living with his very best friend's mother until, his, uh, the, uh, until that lady passed away. He knew what war looked like. And there in that deadliest of years, his speech in Durham College brought up a very different and what he perceived to be a very lethal threat that was emerging in his day. In the very first line, of a book that actually was the compilation of those lectures, it, the, the book became known as The Abolition of Man. In the very first line of that book, he writes this, I doubt whether we are sufficiently attentive to the importance of elementary textbooks. 
He explained by carefully dissecting that school textbook from his day that in that book, he simply called it the green book. He was a very kind man, but what he wanted to do is he talked about the control of language. And it was entitled, the book was entitled, The Control of Language, A Critical Approach to Reading and Writing. By critical, what they mean is from a Marxist perspective, not just critiquing, but trying to break down and tear down critical. And what bothered him was that these authors were disgusted by a story from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And what that story did, it, it, uh, uh, it delved into something, and I know this sounds like nerd city here, but listen carefully. It, it deals directly with our day. He talked about a waterfall. Now, that sounds really innocuous. But the teacher's disgust was because Coleridge speaks of how he felt about the waterfall rather than stating uh, as a truth that the waterfall is pretty. In this particular situation, what the teachers were saying is that no one has the right to state as a truth that something is beautiful or something is sublime. They can only state their feelings. They can only state their emotions. They can't actually state that truth is truth because they didn't believe that truth actually existed. This is back in the war. And he was terribly troubled by the moral truth claims of those guys. Those English teachers are saying that nothing can be actually true. Everything is subjective. And Lewis writing more than 80 years ago was un, uh, uncanny in his prediction of the subjection of truth to feelings and how eventually that subjection of truth to feelings would lead to just a small cabal of academic thinkers telling you how you could feel. Uh, manipulating the truth along religious grounds and actually undermining the very basis of truth. They would eventually take over the role of determining which truth was an acceptable truth in society. He points out the absurdity of this relativism and he even made the statement that a deeply educated thinker could never come to the conclusions these men were stating that the only way such ideas could actually sway minds is by planting the seeds of that absurdity in the minds of young people. In the minds of young people that don't even realize that they are being indoctrinated. He states it this way in The Abolition of Man. He said, the very power of the authors depends on the fact that they are dealing with a boy a boy who thinks he's just simply doing his English prep work. It's not a theory they put into his mind. It's an assumption that 10 years later, his origin forgotten, its presence unconscious, will, will condition him to take one side in a controversy, which he has never recognized to be a controversy at all. What he was saying is that the theological idea, because that's what it is, of relativism was being introduced in such a way that the next generation would view truth as moldable, as malleable. And his foresight was uncanny because he rightly understood that what was at stake were the issues of theology, of ethics, and of politics. It all comes together. Who you are and the way you think greatly determines how you interact with society. We know that. That's just common sense. But we have to ask the question today. These statements made at the height of the war in 1943, do they not sound uncannily familiar? Wouldn't you agree, though, that we have a God who is bigger than our cultural moment? Issues in our culture today are obviously issues of ethics and politics, but they are issues of religion. But the religion that is being taught to so many people is unlike any religion that ever came before it. It, it is overtly religious in its radical core doctrines of radical autonomy in the one hand, and yet demands radical conformity to the demands of radical autonomy on the other. It's perplexing. It declares to the world that it is anti-religious and yet operates in the world with systems of virtue signaling and virtue shaming. It has its seminaries 
set up on university campuses across the country where students learn from programs like gender studies and in philosophy departments where they are taught that there is no objective truth and that the only truth is the truth as Oprah declares it to be. You just live your truth. And that deceitfulness, though, is not new to our day. This is where we actually begin to apply this as Christian men. In the, apostles, in the Apostle Paul's day, there were some in Corinth who distorted and outright nullified the idea of truth. They actually began to oppose the truth of the gospel. And Paul addresses this in a text, and if you have your Bible, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in the first six verses, the Apostle Paul gets right to the heart of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And while the distortion in his day is not necessarily what we're seeing today, which is the idea of outright rejection of settled truth, in his day there were people that were trying to blind people to the truth of God's word. And so what Paul does is he addresses that issue, but then secondly, turns to the church and tells the church what they are supposed to do. Now, let's go back and just give a little bit of run up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 17, he makes this statement, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Bible teacher where you feel like he's trying to just peddle something. He's trying to do like politics does sometimes. He's trying to spin what the Bible says to try to get you to where he wants you to go. Paul is saying that is not the attitude of an actual Christian preacher and teacher. What you experience at Cheyenne Hills Church, what we experience at our church, what any truly uh, theologically right church will do is not peddle the gospel to you. They will tell you clearly what the Bible says and the scripture alone. It's the principle of sola scriptura. In this, he says, we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God. Now, I want you to note something here. He was recognizing we're talking about truth here, but we also recognize that in any genuine Christian body, there is someone we can't quite see right here, but we all know he is here. His presence is here. The Holy Spirit will take what I am telling you from the Word of God, and as your heart is open and willing to receive, the Holy Spirit is the one that affirms in your heart that what you're hearing from the, from the pulpit or what you're hearing here in this circumstance, he's affirming to you, bearing witness with himself, that it is the word of God. That is the hallmark of the Christian. And that is also how we can understand what truth looks like. Let's, let's continue, though. In chapter, after he moves out of chapter two, he, he goes to chapter three and he points out how there were false teachers that were trying to bind uh, the, the, the people of God, the Corinthians, in false philosophies of man. Some had come attacking not only his apostleship, but the very basis of the gospel. And it, that brings us to our passage this morning where Paul gives us five powerful verses uh, that refused to allow the falsehoods of that day to stand unchallenged. And then finally, in verse number six, he gives us powerfully the most possible, uh, the, the, the most uh, um, amazing mission statement that you could potentially read. And this is why I want to leave you with this as we close out this last series of months of men's breakfast. By the way, any men's breakfast that says what? featuring real bacon. You know, this is a godly church. I'm telling you what, I absolutely love that. So we, here we are. Here we, let's unpack this. Verse number one, the Bible tells us this. Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. What ministry though, we have to ask this as the test, text, what ministry is Paul speaking of? In this case, it's the ministry of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, of preaching the whole counsel of God. And what he's saying there is there's no veil, there's no concealment of truth 
Have you ever stopped, I'm getting off my notes here, have you ever stopped to consider why in the world would the Bible show all the warts and everything of its greatest heroes? Have any of you read places where Abraham really messed up? Do you know any pretty famous stories of how David messed up? Do you note that when you go through the scripture, that its greatest heroes, would you see them as our real people, warts and all? And you have to ask, there is a certain understanding of what it's trying to tell you there. It's trying to tell you the facts as they actually existed, and it's not trying to spin them to you. It's telling you truth. The Bible itself has that understanding, that feeling of truth. And here we have it, the Bible not concealing truth according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 John tells us this, and then in John chapter 1 tells us this, that Jesus Christ is the truth. He says, not only this, as you go down, I think it's like around verse 12 of John chapter 1, it says, and this was the light, the true light, which we find in verse 14, is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking about Jesus. That light, the true light, if you look at that in Greek, it literally is ton phos ton alethanon, literally the light, the true what we are talking about and what you listen to when you hear the gospel preached is genuine truth in a sea of error. And it's not only the truth, it is the true light, the light that goes out to shed God's power into, the light, into your life, and then it shines through you into the lives of others. This is the value of truth. God gave him this ministry, he says here in verse number one, and because of that, he refuses to lose heart. And though the world sometimes seemed to line up against him, what he was saying is he found truth in, uh, he found power and strength in God's mercy, and he refused to lose heart. Now look at verse number two. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He's saying there are false teachers who have come into the Corinthian church who were, as he says here, tricky and deceitful. They were crafty. The word handling here is the word doluo, which literally means they would deceive, they would purposely falsify to deceive people into their perspective. Their methods were the same as are always used by forces of evil. It was the shameful enticement of sin, the crafty juggling of truth, the pitching of crafty arguments. But look at verse three. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. What he is saying is that the gospel is veiled or hidden to some, but it's not God's fault. And, and Paul doesn't want anybody to perceive it's his fault either. What he's writing of is that there are some people who simply refuse to hear the truth. Why? He gives the answer in verse number four. Read this with me and focus on this. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. I believe this is the crux of this text right here. Paul steps into the great reason why so many cannot see why so many cannot see the truth, and, and, and as a result, they wind up tearing their own worlds apart. It is because the God of this age has blinded them. John 8, tells us that Satan is the father of lies. And, and we see it here that he targets the mind. I think of the great people who try to study out the mind. And what we see is there is a deep spiritual understanding of what occurs there. Satan, whose language is the language of lies, will tell any old lie to break your life down. He may use the lie that the world popped out of nowhere of its own accord so you don't have to believe in God. He may use the ideas of Freud that you can psychoanalyze yourself out of heart sickness rather than treating it at its source. 
He may use what Paul described to Timothy as oppositions of science, falsely so-called. This is in Romans 1. And what he meant there is that there are ideas that change over with every generation, but the one thing they hold in common is that they doubt the eternal truth of the Scripture. He uses all sorts of lies and things to blind the eyes of neighbors to the truth of God's word. And we see it more and more today. Earlier this year, I was uh, on a long trip and I I read this book that was really intriguing. Um, And in 1984, a paper was presented on the case of a man who was thoroughly convinced that he had been born with two heads. He had born, been born with a phantom second head, and he, at one, one point in his life, grew so angry at his circumstance that he took out a revolver to try to blow his phantom head off. And obviously, he nearly killed himself because, like the rest of us, he was born with only one head. He was diagnosed later with schizophrenia and got some help with this distortion of reality. Around the time of 1984 that the paper was released, people began to talk a lot about bulimia, a situation where people who are either thin or of normal weight essentially will allow themselves to start be starved because they think they are fat. Just two days ago, I spoke with a lady running for Congress who mentioned this same phenomenon in, a, in the daughter of a friend of hers, and this young lady eventually died, and she said at one point you could just take your thumb and your middle finger and, and just put your arm around the, this, this young lady's, um, your, your, your fingers around that young lady's arm. It breaks your heart. We find it, we, we fight hard to help people who are fighting these kind of dysphoric conditions. And yet today, in opposition to clear truth, some people will take a real condition that exists called gender dysphoria, very rare, usually in younger people, and usually five out of six grow out of it by their early teens. But And, and the very, very basis of this word, dysphoria, means literally an emotional state characterized by anxiety, depression, or unease. And in this case, brought on by a distorted reality. But there are some in society today that believe if a young person comes uh, to you with this particular dysphoria, you have to lead them to believe that 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 state of horrible confusion is how they're supposed to feel. That And basically, if they come to you in your church uh, trying to, to get some help, that all you can do is affirm them in their discomfort. The God of this age, in this case, the God of the sexual revolution, demanding radical conformity to his demands of radical autonomy, tries to blind the minds of men with lies. And when you look at how dark all of that is, we have to ask the question, do we surrender to the darkness or is there something we can do? Is there a way that we as men of God can walk out into our society with hope. We'll look at verse five. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the gospel, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, let's stop for a second. The world's burning itself down. People are saying nonsense and peddling it as truth. And the answer to all of this is to go out and live and speak the gospel. The answer that we have been given in the church, the answer we have lived out for 2,000 years is the answer our culture needs today. We can stand up. We can shine light out into the darkness. Oh, there are some who wish that we would just bow to the cultural tides. They will stand outside of the homes of people that disagree with their radical understanding that any baby should be killed. And they'll stand there and protest and threaten. And they just wish that we would bow to the cultural tide. 
And there have been plenty of people in the church that have done that over time. But that isn't how a biblical person would, would, would live it out. And what they do is they refuse to bow. The other thing we could do is try to hide from the cultural tide. In time past, there were individuals who just thought, okay, there's nothing we can do about it. Let's pull everything in. Let's march home and sit there and just maybe praise Jesus real quietly while we sit in our living room and watch some guy on a TV. That way we don't have to handle any of it. Whatever you do, leave the Christianity, though, when you leave the front door in the morning. That doesn't work. You can't bow to the tide. You can't hide from the tide. Some, the third response has been to try to find a new cultural Messiah to lift them up and over the tide. And I won't go into great detail on that, but let me just point out that the idea uh, of many people, whether it's a cultural guy, a great guy like Reagan, or in the past it's been Reagan, Gingrich, Bush, or Trump. Christians have shown a proclivity to focus on personalities rather than the principles. There's not a cultural Messiah that will come and fix your life. The one thing that we should do as Christians is this, to be a lighthouse above the tide, calling out over those who are blind and leading them toward truth. That's what Paul is saying in this text, that this light, this hope, this treasure is housed in us. We are the earthen vessels. That's you and me, vessels that carry truth to the world. And what this fallen world needs is what we are supposed to be giving them. Giving them. We're not to bow. We're not to hide. We're not to try to find someone else to do our work for us. Every one of us, are called to carry the light of truth into our homes, into our churches, into our schools, into our town halls, here in Cheyenne, here off in Washington, wherever it is. And while pop psychology may insist that you are who you are based upon your feelings rather than objective facts, and as our nation starts to buckle under the question of which truth to follow, um, and whether there is even truth at all, it is into this intersection that God calls you as a man of God. Into this junction of truth and culture, God calls you to stand tall and say, waterfalls can be sublime. There is beauty in the world. Truth is knowable. And we cannot be abolished into a sea of made-up feelings. We have the truth, and we cannot fail in our duty to stand up for it. Men, that's your call. That's who God created you to be. Someone who will stand up for truth. It may be that your grandkid comes home and tells you that someone in their school has explained that while they were born a, born a boy, they want to be a girl. That they want to actually begin to have healthy body parts removed and be assigned to a permanent state of having to have a surgery about every year to year and a half. Why? Based on their feelings. Because there is no knowable objective truth anymore. And you as a grandparent are going to have to speak into their life kindly, rationally, reasonably, but point out no. A lot of people may say that there is no truth, but there is truth. You may be a parent with a kid in school, and you, there may be a school that has textbooks that teach stuff to second and third graders that is full on some of the most vile things that one could do in sexual practice. Second and third graders And the teacher may actually believe that that is an okay subject. And you say, no, there is a truth. That child is developing and you're introducing ideas at the the earliest age that breaks down their innocence and, and harms that child. And if you're going to try to teach my child these kind of subjective feelings rather than the facts that I sent that child there to learn, then what we're going to have to do is have a conversation. We have to be men of truth. 
who will live what's right. And sometimes as the culture falls apart, you begin to wonder, is it worth it? Oh, it is. This is the normal stance of the Christian in the world. The United States of America is a beautiful place with a wonderful history worth fighting for. But for most of church history, we've had to be in opposition. So how did they make it? Well, that last song we sang explains it. They kept their eyes on truth. First sermon I ever heard Pastor Galen preach was on staying in your lane. He was preaching it from Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. I loved it. It's a number of years ago now. And in that sermon, he talked about running the race. But what we see is keeping our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set before the right hand of the throne of God. When we look at that, keep your eyes on Jesus. Look at him in his wonderful, sing that with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Sing it now one more time as a prayer. Ready? Sing it now. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can you do that this summer? Keep your eyes on him, knowing that in a sea of error, he is the truth, and stake your colors to the mast and go with it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are truth, that you know exactly where we are in the culture we live in, and you are bigger than it. Father, I pray that you would strengthen and empower the lives of these men. Lord, that they would have their eyes, their hearts, their minds firmly fixed on you, knowing that there are many. The gods of this age have blinded, lest they should see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, and come to you in salvation. Lord, I pray that that wouldn't deter any man here from being a Christian man, from being a faithful man. Knowing what truth is, is determined to walk that way and not fall off to the right or to the left. And who will try to gather those around him to stand up as well. And Father, I pray that you would bless this church as a result. Bless this community. Bless our nation. Father, we need you. And we pray all of this in your name, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs>